and running. Okay, so um, I'm here uh, hiding away in my office, trying to avoid COVID as much as possible. Just got notification a couple of my students were uh, exposed over the weekend and had to go get tested. So uh, hopefully that is not any of you. However, um, today is the last day for early voting from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. today. There's three places in, in uh, uh, San Marcos, including the PAC on campus, the uh, government center, which is the courthouse, and then there's also another one on across from the hospital. So go ahead and look that up if you haven't voted already. Uh, if not, you'll have to wait till November 3rd, okay? So take care and vote if you can. All right, <clears throat> so back to our class. Uh, we have module seven homework, which is the uh, E1, E2 uh, module is due on Wednesday, that is the 28th. Uh, it's set up on Wednesday. It was supposed to be due on Monday, but it's due on Wednesday because we're going to finish that today. We're going to do our group activity. Our group activity is going to do a compare and contrast of E1, E2, E, uh, uh, SN1, SN2. And so that is where we're going to be uh, getting, I think this is a great end capper for this set of two modules because they kind of look like they compete and sometimes they do, but there are some clear distinctions between them and some clear places to look for making those distinctions. And we're gonna go through that today after we finish a little bit about the Hoffman role. Okay. Uh, where is the assignment? At? You should have received an email uh, with an attachment. And I just posted it. Yeah, and I also posted it to the activity section of our thing. There's an activity is also in the um, activity section of Canvas. Okay, already. So there, you should have two choices. Of, uh, somebody got an email, so that's great. Uh, so there should be one attached to the email, which was only sent out about 15 minutes ago. <laughs> I'm sorry. I realized that we wanted to have that whole hour for our uh, review, so we had to do the activity today. So, but so I have about seven slides left on my chapter, my module seven right here, and it's basically the Hoffman rule. Okay, and so we'll have how that competes with Zaitsev's rule, and it has a clear distinction, and we should be able to determine that. Okay, and then for our activity, I'll pull up uh, my uh, set of the activity and show you what I'm looking for, and then I'll go ahead and break you out into breakout rooms, and then you have until midnight to complete it. So what you wanna do is kind of work through the plan with a few people and then go ahead and pretty up your answers or uh, maybe somebody who missed class, you can actually go talk to them and say, hey, this is what I learned in my breakout session. You know, uh, you know, this is what to look for in doing it. You definitely wanna do it yourself because doing it yourself helps you identify E1, E2, SN1, SN2. It seems confusing, but when you start taking it piece by piece, you'll see where it comes from. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and, well, uh, if anybody has questions, go ahead and put it in the chat or chime in. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen to finish up our last few slides, and then we'll break out into our breakout rooms. All right, so nobody's in the waiting room, chat's working, and we're recording. All right, everything's good. Okay, so when we first started um, talking about E1, E2, uh, we said that they were different mechanisms, right? E1 mechanism goes through a carbocation. And then our carbocation can rearrange to give us our more stable carbocation, okay? E2 does not undergo, does not use a carbocation as an intermediate. Our E2 has our base coming in at our beta hydrogen and removing it at the exact same time as we break the bond. That being said, when we remove those beta hydrogens, you typically want to remove the beta hydrogen from the more substituted carbon, giving us rise to our Zaitsev's rule, meaning that the um, more stable alkene is formed by Zaitsev's rule. And so this is very common, especially when you have small bases that aren't sterically hindered. However, if we turn out to have a large base, and when we think about bulky bases, I showed you one, the classical one is T-butanol, which has been deprotonated to give us T-butoxide. Okay, but I showed you two more of these large ones that were called, uh, it's the, uh, okay, no, I'm gonna show you two more. That's what I'm gonna do, all right. Two more that can be used as these really big bases and they tend to, one's called LDA and one is a derivative of that. And so these are big things that have, imagine large alkyl groups 
uh, around them, making them inaccessible to get to the substituted carbon. And if they're in, if those substituted carbons are inaccessible, that means the methyls become the place where we can deprotonate. So it's still an E2 reaction, meaning it's bimolecular, but our base is too big and we're not forming the carbocations. So we actually end up forming the less stable, the less thermodynamically stable. And this is called the Hoffman rule. Okay. So in the Hoffman rule, we have this large bulky group trying to come in and hit our transition state. Remember our transition state happens all at once, come, uh, deprotonation and leaving group and formation of our double bond. But our big, huge, bulky group here is being electrostatically repelled by this large or methyl group here. So that makes the transition state less stable and higher energy because of electron-electron repulsion, okay? So if we actually, instead of taking the more thermodynamically stable material and actually took the base and looked at the less sterically demanding hydrogen, the less sterically demanding beta hydrogen, which would be on a primary carbon, then it is less energy because of the steric interaction with those methyl groups. That means that we're going to deprotonate on the less thermodynamically stable carbon because we can't uh, deprotonate the more thermodynamically stable carbon. So our energy barrier is lower and therefore we actually end up producing the less stable or the less substituted alkene. Okay, so what that means for us is that if something is too big and too is electrostatically repelled by anything other than a primary carbon, we will form a Hoffman product. A Hoffman product is the less thermodynamically stable and the less substituted alkene. Okay, and it has everything to do with this electrostatic repulsion, which means size in this case matters. If you have a small base, you can do your Zaitsev's rule. If you have a big base, you cannot, and you must use Hoffman's rule. Okay, so let's compare and contrast, okay? So in a thing where we have a base, and when we think small bases, think uh, the alkoxide of primary alcohols. So if it's a primary alcohol, there's only one carbon attached to it, and maybe a, a a carbon chain hanging off there, meaning it literally is kind of a straight chain with that charge on the end. So there's very little steric demand for that other section. So in that case, because the activation energy is not increased by that electron-electron repulsion of that big base, we actually now have the lower activation energy with the more substituted carbon or the more substituted beta hydrogen, leading to our more substituted alkene, okay? So it has everything to do with something really small coming in and it's not being sterically pushed out too bad by that other group, okay? So think methoxide, ethoxide, et cetera. These are the kind of bases that are gonna give us our Zaitsev rule, our more thermodynamically stable. And it has everything to do with this transition state, okay? So, in contrast, when we come up with something big and think uh, this is uh, ethyl, let's see, what is this? Uh, it's um, methyl two, uh, no, this is, yeah, I'm sorry, potassium butoxide. When we have this potassium butoxide, it is just so big, it cannot come in and take away the hydrogen off of this more substituted carbon. It must come in and take it off a methyl carbon. Therefore, we have the formation of the less substituted alkene and the product will always be that less substituted alkene. So when we think really large bases, T-butoxide and uh, LDA, which I'll show you in a minute, think backwards than the Zaitsev's rule. It's the opposite of the, the Zaitsev's rule, which is Hoffman's rule, okay? So I think I show you Okay. All right. <clears throat> Do I show you the other bases? I wanted to show you the other bases. No, I don't. Okay. We had uh, somewhere on one of these slides, we showed uh, what we called LDA, which is also a big group. 
Okay. So the other thing that happens in Hoffman's rule is that instead of just having a large base, you can have a small base, but you can have a poor leading group that is big and bulky. Okay. So that's the other time that Hoffman plays a role in the fact that you have a big bulky group that is inhibiting the, even a small base for coming in and taking the more substituted beta carbon. Okay, so when we think of this big leaving group is we think of something that would leave as a neutral molecule, it tends to be a charged species like protonated water, or in this case, um, this tertiary amine, when it comes off, it comes off as a neutral molecule. Now notice those three methyl groups there, those are where the sterics are inhibiting reaction at these sites. And we end up getting our less substituted product or less stable product as our major product, okay? So the same thing happens when we have this uh, methylated uh, sulfur group here. This would just be a, 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 a mercaptomethane substitution, but it turns out that's our leaving group because we made it a good leaving group because we methylated it, turning it into a cation. So when it leaves, it'll leave as a neutral species because it's gonna take the electrons with it. So that when we have, th this is, and this group is just a little bit smaller than this. Notice this has three methyl groups on it and this only has two methyl groups on it. Therefore, it's slightly less selective. It's only 74% the less substituted product. However, it has everything to do with these big bulky leaving groups, okay? So either a big bulky base will cause the less stable product or a big bulky leaving group will cause the less stable product. And it has everything to do with that steric demand. Okay, so how can we kind of help us identify that leaving group, okay? So in addition to a better leaving group, another thing that we can control is the stability of the leaving group as far as acid strength. So in the case of uh, halogens, the hydroiodic acid is the most acidic and hydrobromic acid and hydrochloric acid are below zero. So those are all very strong acids. HF, hydrofluoric acid is actually above zero and it was what we consider to start being a okay acid, it's not a strong acid, okay? So in this case, that idea that the acid strength of the, of the conjugate acid being formed actually plays a role as well. And we still fall under the Hoffman rule because as the acidity of that leaving group decreases, so does the less stable Hoffman product, okay? So if we talked about having this, uh, iodine here on this nice uh, secondary carbon, <clears throat> we would think with a small base that iodine is going to be not that big and it's gonna be a very strong acid when it leaves. So removal of this proton is going to be the primary product, the Zaitsev's product. And we do see that we do get that as the major product, but there's always a little bit of competition with that less stable product. Remember, as long as you have energy enough to get to that transition state, it will make the less stable product. However, you're gonna need more of this product because it's more molecules have enough energy to get there, okay? So our product ratio is about, you know, 80 to 20, okay? So bromine's a little bit bigger, but less acidic. And so we start seeing a shift down where it's, you know, 70, 30, okay? Chlorine is even less acidic and we get down to, you know, 65, 30 right here. However, fluorine is the one. Fluorine is one of those crazy things that because of the bond strength between the fluorine and the carbon, and it's such a poor leaving group because it's not a very strong conjugate acid, we actually can force it to go the less stable product, the Hoffman product. And we'll shift it to uh, 30, 70. So in most of our examples, we're using iodine and bromine as our leaving groups to show you the Zaitsev product is the more stable product. But if ever you see fluorine in there, start thinking, oh, wait, hold it, that's backwards, that's Hoffman's rule. Okay. And it has everything to do with the transition state of the leaving group, okay? So in the case of the bromine 
and the, the, the between the bromine and the fluorine, the fluorine bond is much, much, much stronger. Okay. Because the fluorine bond is much stronger, that we have to be further along in the transition state to get that fluorine to leave. Because of the, even though fluorine is much more electrophilic, it's a shorter bond and it's a stronger bond. So it, it takes more energy to break that bond. So we have to have more of this hydrogen pulled away from the substrate to get this fluorine to leave than we do for the other, for, for the case of the bromine here. Okay. So because of that, we actually have to um, think of this carbon as being slightly negative because it has to have more of that negative charge from the hydrogen before it'll kick out the fluorine. And because of that, we're actually forming a partial carboanion or a carbanion, okay? Carbanion stability is the reverse of carbocation stability. And so that means that a carbanion, a negative charge on carbon, is most stable as a methyl group. Therefore, in this case, we actually have to make that carbon a little electronegative. Up to now, carbon's always been electropositive, right? Here we're making a little electronegative such that we can influence that fluorine to kick out, okay? So fluorine is one of those things that gives you Hoffman products. Big bulky leaving groups give you uh, Hoffman products and big bulky bases give you Hoffman products. Okay. So, and when we look at the transition state, if we move that fluorine around, we actually see that we want to have the least substituted carbon being deprotonated. So you, it's the most stable partially negative charge. Okay. So in this case here, if we pulled it off of this methyl group here, we have our partially negative charge on our primary carbon, which is more stable than a partially negative charge on a secondary carbon, okay? So that makes, and this one, if we pull it off the other side, so that makes this one more stable, therefore it's going to be the more prominent product. All right, so Zaitsev's rule, small bases, uh, good leaving groups like iodine, bromine, and chlorine give you the more substituted alkene. Hoffman's rule, big bulky base, big leaving group, or fluorine gives you the least thermodynamically stable, the less substituted alkene. All right, questions on that? Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna pull up the assignment and then let you guys break out. Uh, just do the first couple together and then finish it on your own and then turn it in by midnight, okay? So let me pull up the activity here. I'm gonna explain what to do and then let you head on out and do it in your breakout rooms. Share and Acrobat Reader. Okay, so you should see this. This is the same, the first page that you see on the activity. And the review is that these are the things to look for in each and every example. Okay, weak polarized bases, we wanna look at, oh, okay, those are mainly gonna produce SN2 products. Because they're weak bases, they're not gonna do elimination. And because they're good nucleophiles, they're gonna do substitution, okay? Strong bases, but good nucleophiles, now we're gonna still do some eliminations, but some substitutions, but they're always gonna be bimolecular because they're strong. Strong things promote bimolecular reactions. Okay. Bulky bases. Bulky bases promote the formation of E2 products because bulky bases that are poor nucleophiles are not gonna do a re remove a thing, wait around for a carbocation. They're gonna do those E2 products. Big bulky bases, E2. Now, Weak bases, weak nucleophiles. Weak bases, weak nucleophiles, like solvents, like methanol and water, okay? They have to wait around for a carbocation. And protic solvents promote carbon cations, okay? So if you had something, a, a substrate with a leaving group on it, heating in methanol, chances are you're gonna look for a competition between an E1 and an E2 reaction, 
Okay. You always have a competition in E1, E2, so you always get a little bit of both products. But think whenever you have a weak nucleophile, weak base, you're thinking that this is going to be an carbocation form reaction, which is SN1, SN, SN1, E1, and they're always in competition. Okay. So that being said, um, so chapter six was SN1, SN2. Chapter seven was E1, E2. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare and contrast them in an exercise that lets you first identify what's the nucleophile, what's the electrophile, et cetera. So I'm gonna go down one page on this one right here. All right, so here I've defined for you to get to really get in your head what a strong unhindered base is, hydroxide and alkoxides of primary alcohols. Big bulky bases are T-butoxide and this other one. This is called, uh, this is uh, diisopropyl uh, amine. And so it's commonly called LDA. It's usually the lithium salt. So this is LDA. And this is a um, big poor nucleophile, but a big bulky base. It's the other thing that gives rise to a Hoffman product in E2 reactions. Then we have weak bases, and we know they're weak bases because their conjugate acids are very strong. These are all good nucleophiles, so we think, ah, substitution reactions, okay? Then we have weak bases, again, because of conjugate acid, but fair nucleophiles. So with fair nucleophiles, we're gonna have some competition there. And then we have our weak bases, uh, which are you know, the monoprotonated uh, sulfur sulfonate and phosphonates plus uh, our neutral alcohols and waters. Okay, so with that kind of idea, we can break it down to the types of substrates we have. Methyl substrates are only gonna go SN1, I'm sorry, are only gonna go SN2, or they're not gonna react at all. For example, if you boil a methyl halide in water, nothing will happen, okay? So that's our weak base, weak nucleophile. With our primary halides, our primary um, with a strong good nucleophiles, with good nucleophiles, is going to be our substitution reaction. Okay, so notice our major strong nu good nucleophiles, both of them have a major product as SN2. However, there's always a little bit of E2 product, depending on how, uh, even if it, it's a little bit basic. However, if you have a strong base, your E2 now dominates. Okay, and with your primary halides, again, weak bases, you have to form that carbocation, so there's no reaction, okay? So your secondary halides is where the most things can happen. Strong, ba oops. Strong bases are gonna give you elimination products as your primary. However, if it's a good enough nucleophile, you're going to get substitution products too. If you have poor nucleophiles, you're only gonna get elimination. If you have good nucleophiles, but not very basic, good nucleophile suggests you are going to have substitution. However, if it's weakly basic, it's gonna eliminate a little bit too as your minor product. And then once you get to, to formation of a carbocation, you're gonna get a mixture. No matter what you do, you are always gonna get a mixture of air, SN1 and E1, because the carbocation forms first, and then it can react with anything available to it. Now, that leads us to one of the easier ones, which is our tertiary halides. We typically only see E2 reactions anytime there's anything that's a base, okay? But if we have weak bases or protic solvents, they can form carbocations. And again, we get the competition between substitution and elimination with a carbocation, which is the SN1, E1. Always in competition, never, you can skew it one way or the other, but they're always in competition, okay? So that leads us to what I would like to see in the activity. So when you do, this is an example of what I'd like to see. So what you're gonna see is on like the next page is I'm just gonna give you the reaction, okay? So the first thing I want you to do is look at this and say, okay, what's the substrate? And what a kind of substrate is. So for example, this is a methyl halide, okay? That means you're gonna start looking at your methyl halide and say, oh, methyl halide, what does it do? Okay, now, the second thing you do is what's the base, okay? 
So, or what's the nucleophile? And so you're looking at this, well, if this is the substrate, that makes this the base and or nucleophile. So now you have to figure out, is it a strong base? Is it a weak base? Is it a strong nucleophile or a weak nucleophile? And write that down. Bulky base, poor nucleophile, okay? If it's a bulky base, poor nucleophile, that's gonna promote a certain reaction, okay? And in this case here, because there are no beta hydrogens, there's no possibility for an elimination reaction. And therefore our only product is our SN2 product. Okay. Most of the time you'll have two products and you have to pick out which is the major product versus minor product, okay? So I'm gonna give you one more example. Well, I'm gonna start you off on number two here and then I'm gonna break you out into breakout rooms, okay? So on number two here, we have a primary halide. So we need to look at the primary halide, okay? And what reactions it can do. And then we have methoxide. We have to determine what methoxide is, okay? You can review with the table or start to think about, oh, methoxide, it's a small base. So it is a non-hindered base and it is nucleophilic. So what can happen? So right there, the fact that it is a strong base and a good nucleophile, and we have a primary halide, we might wanna draw two products and tell us which is the major product and which is the minor product, okay? So this is gonna let you work through each and every step to identify whether or not, you, what your major product will be and what your minor product will be and show you how to identify them as you work through these problems. Okay. So, and there are only six of these and one of them's already done. So you have five of them to complete and then when you upload those, the key will actually release at midnight tonight. And so you can double check your answers at that time. Okay. Any questions? Let me go ahead and stop sharing. Oh no, actually ask questions first. Okay, nobody's typing in the chat. I don't hear any, bloop, 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 bloop. I've re rebooted my modem so that I should be able to hear you. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. I'm gonna go ahead and break you out into breakout rooms. We have 20 of us. I'm gonna do, uh, let's break it out into five breakout rooms. It'll have you about four people. Go ahead and introduce yourself or your first name and, and you know, just dive into number two saying, okay, what do we have? So what are the two possible products? Which one's gonna be major? All right. So, uh, and then if you need me, go ahead and do that request button and then I'll jump from room to room. Oh, let me stop recording so we don't have to do that. And then I'll post this when it's all done. <laughs>